Greetings and welcome into yet another episode of the Kiwi Football Fix. We shine that spotlight largely and squarely on those New Zealand footballers here and abroad. And to help me do that today, we've got Jason Pine, one of the nicest guys in New Zealand radio. He also doubles as New Zealand's premier and prominent football commentator. We'll talk Wellington Phoenix. We'll talk Winston Reid's back to English football. We'll also talk about a legendary Phoenix and all-whites defender who just brought up a, a magnificent milestone in the A-League. But before we do any of that, let's head on over to Norway, where we welcome in all-whites and Viking FK midfielder Joe Bell. Joe, thanks so much for your time today on the Kiwi Football Fix. Yeah, no problem. Excited to talk. Mate, did I get that right? Viking FK? I, I look at it and I see Viking. No, you did. You got it right. I was... I was also pronouncing it Viking for a long time, but uh, yeah, the Norwegians quickly corrected me. Right. It's Viking FK, so yeah, you got it. Okay, so now we know for sure 100% Viking FK. Joe, you're experiencing yeah. your first ever Norwegian winter. How is it treating you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been tough. It's very cold here. Um, I did grow up in the South Island, so I was a little bit used to it, but... You know, the past few weeks, it's been as cold as negative 10. Oh. So, yeah, pretty pretty, br pretty brutal, but, yeah, it's still a beautiful place and, and actually quite similar to New Zealand with the topography. You, you played all but one game in the, uh, in the season. I think it was 30 games long and you played 29, scored a couple of goals. In your own words, how did you rate your performance and the team's? Yeah, it was good. Uh, in terms of the team, we had a bit of a tough start, but it gradually got better through the year. Um, for myself, yeah, I was I was happy. I mean, the biggest thing I wanted to get out of out of coming to Norway was was a good amount of game time. So yeah, I think I achieved that. You know, in the first season, I think there's still uh, a lot more I can do this season. And we've actually had uh, our head coach our head coach step down following the end of the season, and we've got two new coaches come in. So, uh, yeah, a few, few changes in the team and, and slightly in the game style as well. So, yeah, definitely looking forward to, to what we can do this season. What does a, a change in coach mean for you? Because sometimes in, in sport it means that they come in with a, a broom and, and sweep the place clean. Are, are you assured of the, the next two years of your deal? Yeah, 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 it's definitely complicated in that side of football. But, uh, yeah, it was lucky for me. It was actually the uh, the two assistant coaches that actually brought me in from the U.S. They played a, a big role in getting me across. They they are the ones that have been promoted to the head coach positions. We actually have two. So, uh, yeah, for me, I think it's a good thing. But, obviously, you know, football's a, football's a fickle game. So, yeah, just trying to stick with it and stay focused through – this preseason, then hopefully, yeah, have a good season. If you had to be highly critical of your own performance for Viking through the first season, how would you assess your performance? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest weakness, at least, that I'm focusing on is just the more defensive awareness in the midfield. Um, I tend to get a bit focused on what I can do with the ball and, and trying to get onto the ball. And I think... Uh, you know, sometimes I, I lose my patience and focusing on the defensive side. So I think when when you play better teams and, and we played a, a playoff game for the Europa League last season, I think when you play teams of that quality, obviously you have the ball a little bit less. So you need to make sure that your game's balanced and you're an all-rounder player. So, yeah, at the moment, that's what I'm focusing on. So is that more organisational, like dragging people here and there and, and, and just minding what, what you're up to as well? Communication as well? Yeah, to be honest, it's a it's a lot of everything. Yeah, the communication, as you said, that's a it's an interesting point because the boys mainly speak Norwegian on the pitch, so that's been a you know a separate challenge learning some of the language and making sure I'm able to communicate with the players, but also understand what they're telling me. How difficult is Norwegian to pick up? Uh, it's not easy, but, but I'm being there. Don't, don't ask me to quote anything because... Uh, I won't. I don't think I'll uh, do very well, but, yeah, I'm definitely getting there. 
You mentioned the Europa League tie with Aberdeen. Uh, you, you went down 2-0, mm -hmm. but I think the team put in a pretty good account of itself. What did that tell you about how far away Norwegian football is from the rest of the European competitions? Yeah, I think it was a it was a really interesting game for me. Obviously, we kind of hoped the result would go better, but yeah, just to gauge how the team performed and in those kind of settings, and you know, I think it just further gives me a better understanding of European football. But yeah, the team we actually played okay, and I think the game could have went either way. So you know, I think it's quite a it's a good standout for Norwegian football and the ability to compete in those games. I mean. There's teams such as Bodo Glimt, who uh, won the league last season, who took AC Milan to, uh, you know, the, the 90th minute before unfortunately losing. But, yeah, the, there's quite a few teams that are quite strong and can perform in Europe. So I think it's a really good uh, opportunity for young players and it's a strong enough league that it gets watched by other European clubs as well. How did you actually come to reside in Norway, Joe? Because... A few years at the University of Virginia, I would have thought that maybe the logical progression for you would have been into the MLS. There was an opportunity to, to enter the draft, um, and I'm not sure how much understanding there is of, of that whole system. But, yeah, basically for me, it was deciding whether I would want to go into the draft, where I would have little control over which team I would end up in in the MLS. Or, uh, or pursuing the European option. And, you know, after sitting down with my parents for a, for a long time, we felt that Norway would be a, a better option for me. And, you know, to be honest, I, I couldn't be much happier. It would be great without the COVID, so I could have came home. But, yeah, in regards to what I was looking for, I think I got everything uh, that I needed last season. So hopefully that continues. But, yeah, it was a... It was an interesting and difficult choice. Yeah. How hard is it to, to stay grounded as a, a young footballer when you've got somebody from a professional outfit travelling halfway around the world to say, hey, we like you? <laughs> to be honest, in America, it's not too hard because, uh, <laughs> you know, you spend, you spend most of your days with the, the basketball team on the, at the university or even the American football team and... You know, those players are walking into multi-million dollar contracts. So, yeah, it's not too hard. Fair enough, fair enough. Look, 2020, I think, uh, it, it was going to be a big year for you, Joe. Uh, you, as you said, you'd come out of the, uh, the under-20s World Cup and impressed there. You'd made your debut for the, the fully-fledged All-Whites against Ireland and Lithuania, and football commentators were really impressed with what you did there. And 2020 was going to be all about the Olympics. It was going to be all about Belgium. It was going to be all about England at Wembley. And then all of that was taken away. So how, how did you cope with, I suppose, the absence of the football and that loss? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was tough. It was something, obviously, the Olympics uh, was really excited for. And, yeah, as you mentioned, the England game at Wembley, wow, that would have been... Uh, an incredible experience for everyone involved. Um, so, yeah, it was tough, but I just tried to, to keep everything in perspective. And I think, you know, there were definitely people worse off and, and having things taken away from them that were, were far worse than what was happening to me. So I just tried to stay focused on, you know, the football at hand and, and stay focused on the season and, you know, kind of let the, the time go by. Uh, and, yeah, hopefully things are looking more promising for the future and especially for you know, getting back as an international team and getting some more games under our belts. And, you know, it's hard to keep track of all the all the updates. But, yeah, hopefully the Olympics goes forth this year um, because I think, you know, coming off the the 20s and the national team experience, uh, wow, a couple of years ago now. Uh, yeah, I think it's something that, you know, personally I'm really excited for, but also I think the, the team should be as well. Do you hold out much hope for the Olympics? Because if reports are to be believed, you've got government insiders saying, there's no way in the world that this thing can go ahead. What, what, what say you? You must be uh, in WhatsApp groups with your all-whites teammates or your, your, your under-23s teammates, and uh, you must have a, uh, an inkling as to whether it's going to go ahead or not. Uh, to be honest, I really do not. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm no professional at understanding this situation, so... Yeah, I'm really not sure. Obviously, fingers crossed, but you got to do what's what's safe and, you know, make sure that we follow all the, the protocols to, 
you know, go ahead and make sure it's a, it's a suitable, you know, opportunity to, to do it. So, yeah, I, I really don't know, but yeah, deep down, I really hope so, but yeah, safety first. Yep, safety first. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Listen, the, the All Whites debut performance, how, how did that feel, getting out there, donning the All Whites shirt and, and playing with some of our great names presently? Wow, well, yeah, that was a, it was a huge honour, firstly. Um, yeah, you kind of you kind of do get a little bit overwhelmed, but when you get in the moment, everything kind of you know seeps away, and you're you're just playing football again. So yeah, it was it was quite. Uh, you do have to pinch yourself when you're playing in the midfield, and you've got Winston Reid behind you. So yeah, it was a it was a fantastic experience, and you know hopefully hopefully a few more in the future. I'm not going to mince my words here, Joe. You did receive rave reviews for your performances. Like, how, how does that make you feel, knowing that so early in your All Whites career, you looked so comfortable to so many? OK, that's nice. Maybe I need to read more of the reviews on myself. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it's promising. I think, you know, with, with Danny as coach, he's really pushing... Uh, you know, the play style where we want to move the ball and, and compete with the top teams. And he's giving a lot of young players a chance. And I think there's a lot of quality, uh, as we showed with the players in the U20s. So, uh, yeah, it was obviously nice to have what I thought. Yeah, OK, maybe it was a good game. I think there's there's better to come in the future. And I think, yeah, the team's results will come better as well. But, yeah, I think just in that moment, it was a, it was a fantastic opportunity. And... I just tried to play normal football. So I think, you know, we're starting to build more of an identity. And, you know, unfortunately, as you said, the, the COVID situation has interrupted that. But there's been a lot of work going on in the background to keep us connected and, and keep building on that. So hopefully when, when we do get back together, it's only going to get better. What is it about young New Zealand midfielders at the moment? I feel like there must be something in the water or, or something to that effect because <laughs> there's yourself playing in Norway, you've got Sarpreet Singh doing great things, Ryan Thomas. All of a yeah. sudden, we've got a, a, a whole bunch of guys, young guys, who are really comfortable on the football. It's almost like you crave the ball and you don't want to get rid of it. Why, all of a sudden, have we got this um, outstanding crop of comfortable on-the-ball footballers? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it must be down to the the football development in New Zealand. There must be, you know, more opportunities for younger players and, you know, recognising that that may be the most important thing in football is being comfortable with the ball. Um, so I also think it comes from uh, the support and the confidence from the coaches on the sideline. So, yeah, I think maybe lucky enough, there's some, there's some fantastic coaches in New Zealand that have been, you know, moulding these players and, you know, it's nice to get a badge through now, but hopefully there's there's many more to come. Mm. My next guest is a, a guy called Jason Pine, who you may have heard of. He, he calls the odd football game every now and then. Uh, he has yeah. gone on record as to say that you will one day be the All Whites full-time skipper. What does a comment like that mean to you? Well, that's, that's incredibly nice from Piney. Obviously, I know him quite well, and he's you know, a fantastic bloke. So, yeah, that, that does mean a lot. That does mean a lot. And it's definitely a, an aspiration of mine. I think there's many, many more steps to take before that becomes a reality. But, wow, yeah, it's a very nice comment. As long as you're not barking out orders... i the next in... time I see him. Yeah, as long as you're not barking out orders in Norwegian, Joe. <laughs> no, my Norwegian won't get that good. <laughs> hey, so what does 2021 look like for you? A couple of months away from the start of the Norwegian League and then I'm assuming at some point we're going to have some World Cup qualifiers as well. Yeah, hopefully. So, yeah, we've just started pre-season now. So, as you said, yeah, we're a couple of months away from the start of the Norwegian season. And then, yeah, hopefully, obviously, it's, you know, it's complicated, but... You know, there's plans for, you know, the international games and then, as you said, the World Cup qualifiers. So I think it could be a busy year. Um, yeah, I think with the COVID situation, you do just have to focus on, you know, only a couple of weeks ahead of yourself. So at the moment, that's pre-season and just making sure I'm fit and, and ready to get into the Norwegian season. Yeah, and stay warm over there in those minus 10 degree temperatures, mate. Stay indoors and I'll crank the heating. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying my best. Joe, an absolute pleasure to catch up with you here on the Kiwi Football Fix. Go well over there. And, uh, yeah, I hope to see you in the white of the All Whites again soon. Cheers for your time, pal.
Oh, thanks, mate. Yeah, appreciate it. Stay safe. Now, look, there's a guy who I know, uh, and, you know, he, he works in radio, does a little bit of football commentary, but uh, in radio terms, he's on the podium for nicest guys around. You'd put Nigel Yeldon in there as well, maybe Elliot Smith from uh, the old radio sport, now News Talk ZB. Jason Pine is his name. He's also the best football commentator in all the land, and he joins us on the Kiwi Football Fix. Piney, great to see you, mate. How are you getting on? Really good. Well, after an intro like that, I, I can hardly be anything else. I'll try my best not to uh, stuff that, uh, you know, the, those credentials up over the next five or six minutes. But lovely to be here to talk some football with you, Goran. Yeah, as a footnote, as an aside, I was actually the worst person in radio. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like we've got both ends of the spectrum covered. Piney, uh, we, we just had a, a wonderful guest on, Joe Bell out of Norway, who you've said some really kind things about in the past, saying that he is a future skipper of the all white why is it that you hold him in such high regard? Yeah, look, uh, he's a great kid, and he is still just a kid, which is the the really exciting part. There's so much more to come from Joe Bell. Oddly enough, Goran, I was thinking about this, and when Joe Bell was coming through the Wellington Phoenix Academy system, it wasn't obvious that he would be the one that might jump out of that system and really make it, you know, as a as a professional footballer. He was a solid enough player, but he wasn't an eye-catching player. Never really got close to playing for the first team, but then went off to the United States and obviously something happened over there and he just became, well, a couple of things, technically a very good player and second of all, a leader. And when you think about that 2019 under-20 side that cruelly went out of that World Cup on penalties, Joe Bell was the leader of that side and I remember watching him in that tournament and thinking, he's become a proper player. He sits at the base of midfield and feeds those further ahead of him with incisive passes. He can get into goal-scoring positions himself. He's obviously very highly regarded by his teammates and by the coaching staff. I know Danny Hay has big raps on Joe Bell as well. So, look, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see him play a decade or more in the All-Whites, and I certainly wouldn't be at all surprised. In fact, I'd expect him to wear that armband on many, many occasions. Let's talk about football closer to home for now, though, Piney. Your beloved, my beloved black and yellow, the Wellington Phoenix, they finally got a win in the A-League, but, man, it was an ugly win. This is what happens sometimes in football, though, right? You play your best football and you lose. You play your worst football and you get a win. How do you break down that win against the Central Coast Mariners? Oh, scrappy, uh, ugly, a bit of a smash and grab. I, I use that phrase on Twitter and also in the post-match press conference. Uh, Ufuk Talley took a bit of umbrage at it. He didn't think it was a smash and grab. Look, I think the Mariners had by far the better of that second half. Uh, Wellington had played well in the first half and were actually, um, you know, it was disappointing to see them concede just before half time. But exactly what you said, that's football. The Phoenix have played far better than that this season. In fact, that second half was probably their least impressive half of football. And yet you get Joshua Soterio coming off the bench, latching onto a pass from Alex Rufer and, and scoring a goal, which gives them their first one of the season. When you are struggling to get wins, you take them any way they come. And I, I think that is what the Wellington Phoenix will take away from this particular victory against the Central Coast side who were travelling pretty well and, and had another win against Melbourne City last night. They'll say, look, the win's the thing. We got the three points. We did enough to, to um, you know, put up a, a bit of a barrier to what the Mariners were throwing at us in the second half, and we had a guy come off the bench and get us a late winner. So they'll take it, and, you know, I, I think they'll, they'll just take nothing more from it other than that. They've played well in their other three games for large periods. Looking forward to seeing them go against uh, Sydney again on Monday night, and let's hope that this is the springboard towards, you know, a, another similar season to what we had last season. Remember, Goran, of course, they lost all four of their first well, four games last season, uh, so they're already doing better than that. And um, and there have been some really good signs in the way they're playing too. Now, tell us about those good signs. Uh, what, what have you liked about their play? Are there any specific players that have really stood up and, and been counted? I like that uh, the new players who have come in have instantly fit into Ufuk Tale's system. Remember when he first came to the Phoenix at the beginning of last season, he only had seven players. So he had to recruit as well as teach a style. Uh, at the start of this season, he had 15 come back and he, he sprinkled in some new players and they've instantly come into the team and, and looked at home in the system, probably because, you know, the majority of the, the squad already know it. And I've, if you talk about specific players, I've really liked what I've seen from James McGarry, 
talk about some big boots to fill coming in and taking the position of Libby Kakachi, a guy we should have mentioned um, earlier when we were talking about about big prospects for the future. James McGarry's come in and really, you know, cemented a spot at, at left back and, and looked very, very good, particularly getting up and down. Well, we can't talk the good without the bad. We are in the media after all. <laughs> uh, what, what hasn't quite worked for you so far? What are the areas that need to be worked on for the Phoenix? Well, I guess you look at the goals that have been conceded and they've come in two particular fashions, really. The first is counter-attacks and there were the two counter-attacking goals they conceded against Newcastle, which, you know, to concede one's bad enough, two in the same game, to lose that game 2-1 was really disappointing. They seem to have shored that up in the way that they play at the back and and, and the way they, they don't leave themselves exposed so much, particularly with a guy like Luke Devere, who's got a lot of experience at centre-back, but is, you know, the other side of 30 now, so pace isn't one of his great assets. So you just have to be a bit careful there. The other one is defending at set pieces, and the Phoenix have now conceded three goals from set pieces, including the uh, one the other day against the Central Coast Mariners when uh, Alu Kwol, this uh, this really bright prospect out of the Central Coast Mariners, got free at a corner and had a pretty much uncontested header. Uh, it did take a slight deflection on the way in, but I think it was going in anyway. So defending at set pieces is something that is manageable, that is, that is you know, you can work on it, you can set up structures, you can make sure that uh, things like that are uh, harder to achieve goals, that is, for opposition sides. So, yeah, defensively, I think those are the two things. Uh, and, and maybe a little bit more, um, I think they want to be a bit more clinical in front of goal. You know, they've had a lot of opportunities to score goals in their first uh, three or four games and, and haven't always made the most of those chances. So at both ends, they'll be looking for improvement. And look, if we go back to last year, it was exactly the same last year. They conceded goals. In, um, you know, in, fa in a fashion they wouldn't have wanted to and they didn't put away the chances they did create in the first month of the season. That came right and I expect both of those things to come right over the coming weeks for, for this uh, Wellington Phoenix side. Well, if they don't, we'll be straight back to you and, and say, well, what, what went wrong? <laughs> hey, staying yes. with the A-League... I'll be ready and waiting. <laughs> staying with the A-League, a, a Wellington Phoenix stalwart uh, recently brought up a ridiculous milestone playing in Australia now, uh, former All Whites defender, one of your great mates, Andrew Durante, 400 matches. A, a word on him, his longevity, and how he's still going and producing good quality the way he is. Yeah, it's hard to uh, think of a more appropriate nickname than Jura, uh, just so durable, and and 400 top-level games is, is quite the milestone. He's, he's in the top. 10 now of, of players who have played all the way back through the NSL days and into the A-League now. I think, uh, you know, what Jura has managed to do is, is retain a supreme level of fitness and professionalism because, as you know, I talked about Luke Devere before, you know, on Andrew Durante's next birthday, he'll be turning 39. And, you know, that that is getting right up there in terms of professional football and professional sport. Once you're, you're playing into your late 30s and, and knocking on the door of 40, you really do have to look after yourself, both in the way that you train, the way that you recover, which is so crucial, and the way you know you handle your nutrition and your lifestyle outside of the game. And, and he's managed to do that, and, and if anything, has got better in his, um, in his last few years. And, and has rediscovered a hunger for the game that perhaps wasn't uh, there. In fact, I know wasn't there during the um, the reign of Daria Kulisic at the Wellington Phoenix's coach. Uh, you know, Jura had some very dark days during his reign as coach, as did a number of players, actually. But he found new life under Mark Rudan. He's found a new home at Western United and looks as though he's enjoying his football again. And and um, and May, you know, who, who knows? This, this may not be the end. Every season he says, this will be it. But um, if history tells us anything about Andrew Durante is that you, you never know that it's it until there's an official press conference and, um, and it is it. So, yeah, I've been uh, really enjoying watching Jura play and it was, it was amazing to watch him bring up that 400-game milestone and have his family there and, um, you know, such a, a top bloke as well. There aren't too many around the league who have a bad thing to say about him. Yeah, he's a top man, all right. Speaking of uh, all-white central defenders, Winston Reid on the move. He's out of the MLS. He's back to English football, but not with Liverpool, as we might have hoped. Uh, he's with Brentford. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts on his uh, move back to the UK? A loan deal from West Ham. 
Yeah, great to have him back on the field is the is the main thing. He obviously played at Sporting Kansas City in the MLS and had a dozen games over there for that franchise, came back and, and I think would have found it hard to push for a spot in the West Ham team. They're doing well at the moment up into the top five or six in the Premier League. But Brentford came calling and look, while Brentford isn't a, uh, a side that, you know, conjures the images of a Liverpool or a Manchester United or even a West Ham United, <laughs> they're a team who are pushing hard for promotion to the Premier League. In fact, Winston Reid debuted off the bench this morning in a game against Bristol City and Brentford won that game 3-2. They're now second in the championship. The top two earn automatic promotion to the Premier League. So no playing down in League One or League Two with to those teams. This is a team pushing hard for a first ever entrance into the Premier League. And Winston Reid's joining at just the right time. He's he's coming into a team that's obviously flying, full of confidence. There's clearly a place for him because he was right into the match day squad and made his first appearance off the bench. So I, I think this is terrific for Winston Reid. He's still got a lot to offer. If he can get those niggly injuries under control, uh, it might be that the move is made permanent should they get promoted. And then all of a sudden, Winston Reid's back in a Premier League side, which is important, of course, for New Zealand football with the World Cup coming up in 2022. You want Winston Reid playing as many games as he possibly can. Yeah, but come on, mate. You're a Liverpool supporter like me. There must have been just a, a little hint of sadness knowing that he, he was originally linked with Liverpool and, and we're struggling for centre-backs. You know this. Where's Virgil van Dijk and where's everybody else? I mean, Fabinho falls over. I know he's a, he's a central defensive guy, but uh, midfield, but um, yes, we, we, we need somebody of that standing. Yeah, it would have been a dream, wouldn't it, to see yeah. um, to see our very own Winston Reid in, in a Liverpool shirt. You and I, as you say, Goran, long-time Liverpool fans, and and to have one of your own there. I mean, there have been so few New Zealanders who have played Premier League at all. In fact, I own half a dozen there are who have, who have done that. To have one of them play for Liverpool would have been quite amazing. I suppose similar to when Ryan Nelson turned out briefly for Tottenham. A lot of Spurs fans around the country took real pride in that. So yeah, it would have been nice. Uh, it would have been nice. But like I say, I think for the reasons I outlined before, he's found a good home. And I'm really looking forward to following the bees, as they're called, as they uh, push for promotion to the Premier League. All right, mate. I'm not going to keep you too much longer, but first, uh, before we depart from your lovely... Is this a lounge room? Uh, or uh, Where are we? Are we in the kitchen? No, this is the uh, this is the uh, the Pine Lounge here. Yeah, okay. I've, um, I've managed to find a quiet space. Kids are back at school, which is handy. Good, good. So before we, we leave you in your lounge uh, and uh, we move on with our day, we need to talk about the ISPS Honda Men's Premiership. Massive game coming up this weekend. It's Auckland City against Team Wellington, who suffered their first defeat of the competition last weekend. How do you see this one going? Well, I think Auckland City have to be favourites. And and Team Wellington, I think, apart from one or two occasions, and I've seen them play a lot this season, haven't really delivered on their potential. They have obviously a very good roster. They were unbeaten up until last week, but they'd had a heck of a lot of draws. And in a couple of those matches, had actually been quite lucky not to be on the losing end. They are a good side, but they have struggled for consistency this season. Auckland City, on the other hand, you look at their roster, Goran, and they are absolutely stacked full of talent. You look at the players who can't get in the team at the moment, and I know they probably rotated a little bit the other day against Hawks Bay United, but you know Mario Bielan couldn't get in the team. Albert Riera was <laughs> on the bench. Jordan Vale, Tom Doyle, former Phoenix player, wasn't even in the squad. So you know, and they've just added um, a couple of players: Sam Brotherton, uh, an All Whites defender, and Kane Vincent, a highly rated striker. So they're adding players in as well. You forget that you know Emiliano Tade is injured. So they're so deep in terms of their squad. They very rarely lose at Kiwatia Street. They've got a good record historically against Team Wellington. And they know that if they win on Sunday, that they are pretty much guaranteed a top two spot and therefore a home semi-final. Having said that, Team Wellington know that a loss might knock them out of the top two because Eastern Suburbs only two points behind. They play Waitakere on Saturday and would jump ahead of the Team Wellington side with a win there uh, until Sunday at least. So there's a bit on the line now with four regular season games to go. You want to be in that top two to host a semi-final. And uh, look, Team Wellington will be very disappointed with the loss to Waitakere. One thing I'll say, Goran, they did it without uh, their, their talisman, Mario Barcia, who is the beating heart of this Team Wellington side, so integral to what they do. He missed the game last week through yellow card uh, accumulation. He'll be back on Sunday, and I would expect if Team Wellington are to turn things around, 
that Mario Barcia would be right at the heart of it. Ah, there's no chance against my pal Jose Figueres, men. You know, embarrassment of riches, as you've outlined. So they're screwed, Piney. They're absolutely screwed, Team Wellington. But you aren't. You are an absolute legend. And I thank you very much for joining us on the Kiwi Football Fix. I think just further enhancing those credentials as one of the nicest men in New Zealand media. Well, it's been lovely to be here. And uh, look, I'll, uh, I'll take on board what you say about Auckland City and let's have a, a text conversation around six o'clock on Sunday evening, shall we? Look forward to it, Jason. A pleasure as always, mate. And I look forward to your company again soon here on the Kiwi Football Fix. Tom Angoran. Thanks, mate. All right, we're almost out of time here on the Kiwi Football Fix, but I have to tell you, those matches that uh, Pining alluded to or mentioned in depth, the uh, Auckland City FC against Team Wellington fixture, we've got it on Sky, Sky Sports 7B in sport. It's uh, Sunday at 4 o'clock, kick-off in that one, 1v2 on the ISPS Men Premiership ladder. And uh, the Wellington Phoenix, yes, they've got Sydney FC. They're try trying to avenge that 2-1 loss. Uh, earlier in the season. Sydney FC, Monday night, 9pm, on the same channel, Sky Sports 7B in sports. But on behalf of Joe Bell, Jason Pine, this is me, Goran Paladin, saying we'll catch you next time on the Kiwi Football Fix.